You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to Faith and Other Oddities. Uh, I'm with uh, Emily via Skype this week uh, <laughs> due to some sk- scheduling conflicts. Um, we are, we're going to be doing it this way. So if the show seems <laughs> a little off or oddly paced, that's why. Um, it's because our lives are off and oddly paced right now. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. So, um, but yeah, we're still going through the Bible. We're still in the book of Second Samuel. Mm-hmm. Um, already in Second Samuel, that's that's kind of interesting. But um, yeah, so we just finished up with uh, Mephibosheth, who was uh, Saul's son. Is that grandson. Right? Grandson. Saul's grandson. Jonathan's son is what I meant to say. Mm-hmm. Um, there's names involved, and I can't remember those most <laughs> of the time. So anyhow, uh, we just finished up with that, and we are moving on into further into chapter ten, starting on yes. chapter ten. Well, we kind of got through like verse 2a last week, and we were setting up the the contrast between David and Mephibosheth and uh, David and Hunan and the, the, I'm sorry, let me make sure I got, got that name right. Uh, yeah, Hanun. 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 Yeah. Hanun. Hanun. Is, ha, ha, is the... It's probably like Hanun or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Hanun. H- I, I'm Hunan's hungry. the chicken. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm just a little hungry here. So, and, uh, but we've got through that and we were setting up the contrast between the two of them because David had extended some, uh, oh, uh, kindness and covenant loyalty, some chesed to Mephibosheth. And now he's turning around and he's doing it to Hanun, the king of the Ammonites. And so this is really odd that he would do this. And we've got to figure out exactly what's going on. And this is really the setup for chapter 11. And of course, chapter 11 is probably the most infamous part of David's life because that's when we're getting into David and Bathsheba. Sure. So we're going to pick up with uh, 2A. I know we're picking up in the middle of a, of a verse, but I, I think most of our listeners, you know, they do t- have a tendency to listen um, in, in binges. And so they're probably going to keep up with us. Two way uh, picks up. It says, "So David sent his servants to console him, and let's talk about Hanun there, his, to, concerning his father." And David's servants came to the land of the Ammonites. Now the Septuagint says David sent his servants, and if we were reading this in the Greek, we would all know this word. It's paraklesia. So if you know your New Testament, sure. Oh, oh! you know this, because when we talk about Jesus sending the paraclete, the comforter, oh, okay. we know the, yeah, yeah, we're talking okay. about the Holy Spirit. Gotcha. And it's, it's the exact same word in the Septuagint as we have in the New Testament. And so to, to really spell it out, the Messiah, the warrior king, he is sending comforters to the Ammonites. So are you saying that the Septuagint uses that same word that Jesus uses? exact same word okay that's interesting it it really is because when you see how it plays out there i think there's some real good teaching points in here and uh we're going to talk about those but let's go on with the story and then we'll come back and pick this up so but the princes of the ammonite said to hanun their lord do you think that because david has sent comforters to you that he is honoring your father has not david sent his servants to you to search the city and spy it out and overthrow it so when David sends uh, servants to Mephibosheth, you know, Mephibosheth responds by acknowledging immediately David's king. And he says, you know, he is David's servant. And when David sends servants to another kingdom, then they're suspicious and they can't believe that David is sincere and they attack the messengers. So, you know, We see this pattern played out today that, you know, when God sends comforters, you know, a lot of times when we as Christians go into a situation where there's non-believers, they have a hard time accepting that we might be sincere, that God is sincere in Mm. reaching out to them. And, you know, the, the nature of these kingdoms is 
as being opposing is really spelled out in the names. I mean, when you have Yonatan, you know, God has given, Yah has given, is the father of Mephibosheth, but the father of Hanun is Nakash. And so Nakash connects us right back to Genesis 3 because that's the Hebrew word for the serpent there in the garden. And it's, you know, the serpent in the garden sows seeds of doubt, and now the servants of the serpent sow seeds of doubt in Hanun. And so I think it's a really interesting picture, and it's a great parallel there that um, you really don't get unless you go back to the original languages. Because, you know, otherwise, how do you know that the serpent is in the cash? How do you know that this is the same word that Jesus is going to use to describe the Holy Spirit? You have to have all of those playing together, both the Hebrew and the Greek. And this is why the original languages are so important. Right, so, right. And... <laughs> yeah, and you can get me started on the fact that a lot of seminaries are cutting language programs and, you know, we're just, we're hurting ourselves. We, we need to be studying these languages, but I won't get too far adrift on that. So verse four, so Hanun took David's servants and shaved off half their beard, half the beard of each and cut their garment in the middle at their hips and sent them away. Verse five. When it was told to David, he sent to meet them, for the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, uh, remain at, the, at Jericho until your beards have grown and then return. So, you know, these acts are meant to humiliate. I mean, that, that's all they're meant to do. And, you know, it's not just an attack against these men as messengers. It's, it's an attack against David because doing something to the king's messenger is the same as doing it to the king. Right. And... This also is an attack against God because it makes the men incapable of observing the Torah. And so, you know, in Jewish law, the men did not, tr did not trim their beards. Uh, that's Leviticus 9, 1927. And cutting the garments would have made them unwearable because it would have removed the fringes, which they're commanded to keep in Deuteronomy 22.12. Yeah, and I am curious about like so did they did they trim like half the beard like say the beard was long and they trimmed it halfway up or did they cut was it vertical? It it seems to be that it was vertical and I, I'm it, the idea that it would be the way to make them the most look the most ridiculous as possible. And okay. so yeah. it, it really was trying to humiliate them for the sake of humiliation and so, you know, you cut it halfway up, maybe, but if you, if you cut it, you know, along the, the center line, then, I mean, now they just look stupid. Yeah, and, it, I mean, it, it just kind of seems like a college prank kind of at that point, really. It, 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 it really does, and it shows you that people, uh, you know, they don't change. And I think it also demonstrates the fact that this king probably was a very young king. And so he, he was not very mature in anything he's doing and the fact that he would listen to the advisors when his father and David had covenants and treaties tells you that he's not somebody who's able to respect what his father put in place which is a common theme in the ancient Near Eastern rule is that a new king rising up uh, especially if they've had a very popular and successful father they're going to do what they can to to distance themselves from their father we also see that with Solomon's sons. Uh, we don't see it so much with Solomon and David, but we do see it in other mythologies and uh, recounts of the king's exploits that the, that the sons would do whatever they could to, to say, I'm my own person. And so the fact that Hanun would do this is really in keeping with his culture. Now, Alter notes that these clothes um, that they're wearing, the, the word here is, it denotes that this is clothing worn in the act of an official duty. And so this further enforces that or confirms that point that these men were representatives of David. And this is what makes the act all the more offensive. And that the idea that this king would dare to insult David this way, especially when it's in the middle of kindness and showing the king this chesed. So David takes pity on his men and he tells them to stay in Jericho. Now, this is the first city that they would have encountered going into Israel from the Ammonite ter territories, but it's far enough away from Jerusalem that they wouldn't have encountered friends or family or anyone they would have known. So they could, you know, 
let the beards grow back and kind of let the sting die out just a little bit. You know, they wouldn't have got full length, obviously, but they could at least have their face covered. And that was the important part, that the face was covered. So, verse 6. When the Ammonites saw that they had become a stench to David, the Ammonites sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Reob, and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, and the king of Maka with 1,000 men, and the men of Tob, 12,000 men. So, Bergen, go ahead. My brain <laughs> malfunctioned. Um, you said 20,000 foot soldiers, and I was like, that's very tall. <laughs> um, so sorry to carry on. Oh, it's still early for me on a Friday. I know this has been a crazy day, but uh, Bergen suggests that Hanun's strategy in humiliating David and that you know the fact that he immediately jumps to hiring these soldiers was probably to provoke a war and it was to negate those treaties that his father Nakash had um, had established. Now having um, Mercenary soldiers at this point in time was was very common. It was uh, something that we know happened with other nations, but we also see Israel hiring the, the armies of other nations to fight on their behalf in First and Second Kings. So, a very established uh, way of dealing with uh, warfare when you don't want to kill your own people. Now, um, hey, in, in First sorry in First Chronicles nineteen six, it includes the detail that Hanun paid. 1,000 uh, talents of silver in order to hire these guys. And what that works out to is about four tons of silver. So this was not cheap. He was really that, invested. Now that's a lot of silver. I, I think I have it correct on that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't think there's any way you can get around it being a huge amount. So verse 7, when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the mighty men and the writer is setting us up, and he has been for a while. Uh, the Ammonites saw David heard. David, I, David is sending, um, you know, he's no longer at the front lines of the battle. He hears back from the front lines, but he's not actually there. And we really have David moving away from that role of the warrior king that he had been, you know, the king who was chosen because he had led the armies out and brought them in, like we were told, Second Samuel 5, verse 2. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he's gotten very comfortable with staying in Jerusalem. And he's okay with sending Joab out to do his work, which is going to get him into a lot of trouble in chapter 11. And I think we kind of already know that. That's not something that uh, I'm spoiling the story for anyone. In verse 8, um, the Ammonites divide up the armies and the hired armies, and the Ammonites line up at the gates of Rabbah, which is an Ammonite city, and the rest of the armies that they hired, they go out into the open country. Now, in verse 9, we're told that Joab um, sizes up the situation, and, and we're really given a ridiculous amount of detail for a battle in the Bible, because most of the time we aren't told any details of how battles actually fought. We're just told it happens. And so Joab takes the best men, the, the, the elite men of David's mighty men with him to fight the Syrians. And then in verse 10, we're told that Joab sends the rest of Israel's armies with his brother Abishai, which we remember that back from the whole situation with Abner. Abishai was there. And Abishai leads his troops against the Ammonites. We're being shown something about Joab. We're, we're being shown that he is a very savvy warrior. He's a great general. But we're also being shown that, that Joab is to David what David was to Saul. And again, this is a little tip off. We need to be worried about what's on the horizon. Because what happens next in chapter 11 is so disturbing. But if we don't have these pieces in play, then we don't understand how David went from being this very faithful man who just had this conversation with God in front of the ark, and God establishes his covenant with him, to mm -hmm. David, the guy who can do what he did to Bathsheba. So we also know that Joab is going to play an important role in that, but we see that he really is a guy with an eye on the prize. He, he's going to complete his mess, me, um, mission. And, and, you know, and we know already Joab has his flaws. We saw that earlier when he did murder Abner. And, you know, 
there's a little bit of distrust in us that's been kind of sewn in there by the writer of Samuel about Joab because who is he really? But right here we're being shown that he's a man who's incredibly loyal to David and he is a man of faith. I mean, just listen to what he says. Verse 11, and he said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, and he's talking to his brother here, then you shall help me. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come help you. Verse 12, be of good courage and let us be courageous for our people and for the cities of our God, and may the Lord do what seems good to him. So, you know, he's devised a plan. He's, he's encouraging his brother. He reminds his brother what they're fighting for. They're fighting for the cities of God. And he concludes his, phrase, uh, his speech with a phrase that if the ESV had been consistent, you would know that you're hearing something that takes us back to judges because he says, the Lord will do what is good in his eyes. So Joab is really, he's offering up a paradigm that's the exact opposite of what we'd seen in Judges. Mm -hmm. But you, again, you miss it if you're just reading English. And the fact that Joab is making this, he's making this declaration of faith. I, he's not even saying we're going to win. He's just saying God is going to do what's good. And he's going to be okay with that. And, and that's kind of a huge thing for, for anyone to be able to look at the situation, especially when things are falling in on you and it looks like, you know, your life's in danger or, you know, uh, your, your livelihood might be endangered, whatever, to say whatever God wants to do in this moment, it's going to be good because this is what God has chosen to do. We don't sure. expect to hear this from Joab, the murderer, the guy who killed Abner. Who, who felt like he had to manipulate and even defy David in order to make sure that Israel was secure. Mm -hmm. And so we, it's a totally different perspective on Joab. And I think that's one of the beauties of Samuel is none of the characters are just all good or all bad. They, they're human. They're, they're very, very human. They're very mixed. You have these conflicting moments in their lives. And who among us doesn't have conflicting moments in our lives where we just I mean we get it right some days and then some days man we we get it so wrong race so uh, verse yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so verse 13 the the Syrians flee before Joab and, and there's no record of any kind of battle we just know they run away from him so there's this indication not a full-on statement by the by the writer but an indication that maybe God is fighting this battle on behalf of Joab and therefore, on behalf of David, uh, the Ammonites see that the Syrians are running and they run away from Abishai and the Ammonites retreat back to Rabbah. So at this point, Joab returns to uh, Jerusalem rather than attack the Ammonites in the city. And it's really funny here. The rabbis uh, credit him with a lot of wisdom and discretion at this point that you know, he he had fulfilled his duty in that he had um, defended Israel or defended Jerusalem and Israel, but he left the right of conquest for new lands to David. So he protected David. Uh, this is their the rabbinic reading. He protected David from uh, temptation, uh, uh, the temptation to jealousy, and it was jealousy that had driven uh, oh, that wedge between Saul and David. So they actually praised Joab for, for being very wise in this moment. So verse 15, uh, the, the, the Syrians, they, they regroup after the defeat. And the Syrian king had Ezer, which we saw had Ezer back in chapter 8. Um, he calls for re uh, reinforcements from beyond the Euphrates. At this point, David takes the field, and we're in verse 17, and he leads all of Israel, not just a few mighty men, but all of Israel, and they cross the Jordan to meet the Syrians in battle. And we're specifically told that they fought with David. So David is, is stepping out, and we kind of breathe a little sigh of relief because this is the king we want. This is who David's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And after they fight with David, they flee, the Syrians flee before Israel. However, if you're paying attention, you're going to note there's no mention of uh, God at all in any of these passages. 
The last time we heard about God was from Joab, not David. We expect to hear it from David, not Joab. Mm-hmm. And and the the fact that David actually has to fight where they just simply flee before Joab raises some questions. Who is God showing more favor to in this moment? Now, however, in verse 19, we are told that David does win a decisive victory. And the kings who were servants at Had Ezer now make peace with Israel and they become subject to Israel. And the Syrians are now too afraid to come over and help the Ammonites. Now, mm-hmm. the, pra- the practical outcome of this is David now controls all the territories to the north as far as Damascus. And this is what had been promised to Abraham. We talked a lot about how that covenantal promise to Abraham is being fulfilled with David's rule. And sure. this, yeah, this means that David now has control over the highway of the, the uh, sorry, the highway of the kings, and the Via Mare, uh, the Via Maris. Sorry, <laughs> but um, these are the two most important trade routes through this region. So we're we're getting multiple uh, sources of income on tariffs and taxes coming into David's kingdom. This is what's going to set Solomon up to do all of his building projects because. He's going to have these great streams of revenue. It also causes the most powerful nations in that part of the world to be really reliant on David for his favor and his grace to travel through his land. And you see how these victories aren't just getting Israel more land. They're actually making more provision for Israel to dwell with with prosperity within the land, also fulfilling the promises that God made to Abraham, Moses, and Joshua all along the way. And it's it's really interesting to see that David as king it is he's stepping into this role even as these little seeds of doubt are being planted by the writer. And I think that's the 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 beauty of the book of Samuel and in some ways this is why Samuel is so much more appealing to me as a reader than the book of Chronicles will ever be. Now, yeah, cuz the, the- yeah, the characters tend to get a little one-dimensional compared to Samuel in Chronicles. They get a little more one-dimensional, and it, you know, no one, no one really cares for a story with one-dimensional characters. At least I don't. <laughs> exactly, I- exactly. And this is the thing that the the writer of Samuel actually gives us a lot of the points in the Bible that a lot of non-believers have a problem with, and that's a certain amount of bravery to be able to present the people of God as being flawed, particularly someone so important as David. Well, and, but that's the point. I Mm -hmm. mean, when we keep going back to this, that, you know, everyone wants any, most of the time, not most of the time, but a lot of times when you hear criticism of the Bible, like you mentioned, I think it was last week or the week before, I don't remember that most of the criticism comes from the old Testament. And it's about how the people of God were messed up. And mm-hmm. all the messed up things that happen. And it's like, yeah, that's exactly right. That's the story. The story is that the only person who's good enough to redeem humanity is its creator. And and that's where we we have to keep landing. And we mm-hmm. look at it and we go, yeah, we're, humanity's flawed. Well, and <laughs> we all we all need God. We all need Jesus. It's not just those of us who live today and, you know, the, the evil, terrible world that surrounds us, um, that everybody from the beginning of time mm-hmm. has needed God's grace. And so even our heroes of faith. But like I said, this chapter um, really does, it, it was set here to, to contrast with Mephibosheth's story. And you'll notice that it, it contains that um, theme of division of paths. So we've got the uh, divided beards, we have the divided clothing, we have the Ammonites, they divide their forces. Uh, Joab divides his army. And we are being set up for the great division that's going to happen under you know, after Solomon dies. Mm-hmm. But all of the stuff that happens with Solomon is really set in place and, and set in play with chapter 11. Because if chapter 11 hadn't happened, then we wouldn't have Solomon, or would we? Uh, that's a really good question, and we're going to talk about 
Well, I mean, now you're getting into some really weird, like, <laughs> metaphysical time travel, similar story <laughs> stuff, and you, you're you're really getting. I mean, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer, and I don't know that anybody does. Right. <laughs> Uh, well, and, you know, when we see how so much of Israel's history, you can almost always, with every major conflict or even every ma major blessing, you can always go back to the inception of it and where it begins. And Solomon's life begins in chapter 11, and uh, or the the joining of his parents begins in chapter 11. So Right, yeah, because that wasn't Solomon. That was another child that did not live. Yes, and that's going to be some fun uh, yeah. well, questions we, to get to. Yeah, I know we'll get there. I'm, yeah, Sorry, I'm jumping the gun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, we're, we're going to jump into chapter 11 because I think, um, I think the contrasts are pretty evident with Mephibosheth and Hey Noon. Uh, you know, one reacts with just, gratefulness and a sense of humility and you know what what have you to do with a dead dog like me is Mephibosheth's question and you know and hey noon just violently insults David he insults the messengers he insults God and so the fact that we do have this strong contrast also allows us to see what's happening next because the question of Hanun's story with David isn't so much was um, you know with the Ammonites attack we knew the Ammonites are going to attack the Ammonites have always been problematic going way way back to to Balaam and uh, Numbers twenty two and twenty four the question is why would David do such a thing and was his compassion and his chesed misplaced by extending it to somebody of the opposite kingdom. And that's, that's the problem with David. David seems to be acting at this point like he's more righteous than God. You know, God wants the Ammonites destroyed, and here David says, oh, no, we're going to be nice to them. And because we learned that the Ammonites, I mean, they're, they're supposed to be wiped out, where it's completely appropriate that David does honor Mephibosheth, and he does show him Hesed, because Mephibosheth is, he's part of the covenant community. And that's where I think some of these, these teaching points come out when we're, you know, how do we respond to a member of the opposite kingdom? And now I'm not saying that, that we wipe them out like they're Ammonites, but we need to recognize that when you're dealing with someone who, who's been hurt or has suspicion of the church because of a hurt, that they can hurt you, that they can respond negatively and so sometimes you you need to hold back and you need to recognize that there there's limits to what you can do for someone who doesn't trust the god you serve and i think sometimes we tend to be i want to be very careful in how i phrase this because there, there's balance here I, I think sometimes we we have a tendency to be nicer to people who don't share our faith in an attempt to look good than we do sometimes people within our own body or a right. member of our family. Uh, and of course, we also fall on the opposite side of that um, equation too sometimes. So, you know, not, not all of us are guilty of messing it up in the same way. So we see Christians who are, you know, oh, I've got to be kind and loving to everyone and just let them do whatever they want because this is grace, this is forgiveness. And that's not the way we deal with with the world and life. We need to have boundaries, proper boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then there's there's times that we're like, oh no, I can't have anything to do with someone who is um, not a not a Christian. I need to stay far, far away from them, which totally negates the our ability to actually uh, minister and to witness to the world. And so we've got to find that balance, and we need to use wisdom, and we need to use discernment. And that's a hard thing because it does require personal responsibility. It takes time. It takes effort. It's not just, you, you can't come up with a formula. Right. You, you, so we, we need to be paying attention to God. But in David's case, this is the beginning of an inversion. His priorities are getting messed up mm -hmm. because he should be taking care of Israel, not the Ammonites. And the 
the thing is with the Ammonites, what we need to remember, I think most of all of Hanun, Hanun is the son of Nakash. And so we have it very clearly spelt out that this guy is not of God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that's going to play into um, some other questions. We're going to talk about the questions when we get to Psalm uh, 51, because David's kindness to Nakash opens some doors for some very interesting speculation, which uh, is going to, we're going to get to take some journeys into some rabbinic tradition there, which I think are interesting. Uh, I don't necessarily ascribe to them, but I, I do find them interesting. So I guess we'll jump into chapter 11. This is the chapter I think most people are going to be looking for. Well, it's one that we're, we're very familiar with. I mean, as much as it, I do find it funny as much, well, okay. I, I mean, I, it, it's not really all that surprising, but you know, the, as much as we want to make our biblical heroes these, you know, characters, these superheroes who, you know, never did anything wrong and we can use their lives as a moral lesson, this story has been taught so much at church. I mean, I think, I think I, I remember Sunday school during, you know, when I was in grade school hearing this story <laughs> and it's kind of like, hmm, this might be inappropriate, but, <laughs> you know, for the age level, but the David and Bathsheba, that there's a, Everyone seems to be intrigued by this story, and I don't know why it is this one, you know, is, is such a you know such a big deal, especially in in churches. Unless you know, I guess we can kind of suspect that possibly it's this whole vilif vilification of of women that the church likes to do. That's the nearest I can figure, and I imagine we're probably going to touch on that. So I'm going to let you <laughs> have it, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Right. I would say as far as David's life story goes, this is probably the second most uh, famous story. Uh, the next one would be David and Goliath. And it's almost hard to imagine they're the same person. This really is the turning point in David's reign. It, it's the turning point in his personal life and within his family. But because he is king, it's also the turning point in the nation of Israel itself. And mm. David really goes from being that epic warrior king, where before we'd seen that, yes, he was drawing back, but now we're seeing that he's basically, he's put it aside. And, um, you know, at, at best, he comes out of the story as an adulterer and murderer. At worst, he comes out of the story as a rapist and murderer. And his fall is so profound that Brueggemann actually relates it back to Genesis 3. And we're going to see why that's a totally valid thing to do, that David's fall is on the same level, almost on the same level as Genesis 3. So out of all the biblical tales um, of defeat and God's, you know, the failure of God's people, this is probably um, the one that troubles the modern reader the most, because how do we celebrate David as a man after God's own heart? You know, and how can we appreciate the, the beautiful psalms of praise and the, the psalms of lament and brokenness uh, whenever he's guilty of such heinous acts? And I think even more importantly, how can we still hang on to him as a foreshadowing of the Messiah? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no one's comfortable with sexual sin. And uh, no one's comfortable with David being an underhanded murderer. I mean, he doesn't even like have the guts to murder Uriah himself. And he could have been and uh, he could have mur murdered Uriah himself if he wanted to. But instead, he had to be sneaky and, and duplicitous about it. And, you know, he had a problem with that back when uh, Ishbosheth was killed. He didn't like that kind of deceit. And. Right. So how do we uphold his legacy as the anointed one, as a Messiah? Because, uh, just a quick note, there are several Messiahs in the Bible. The, it's not just Jesus the Messiah. Uh, in the Old Testament, we have various people who fulfill that role in some aspect, but they never fulfill it in the totality like Jesus does. And, and David is one of the big ones. And I think this story is 
where we as Christians kind of fall off the rails because we attempt to minimize the impact of the story either by ignoring it or we try to shift the blame from David to Bathsheba and claim that he's the victim of her seduction. And, or, you know, unfortunately, as much as we talk about context, this is one of the times that people try to use context in the wrong way. Uh, you know, this is what kings did. This is just a product of his society. Uh, we we just do whatever we can to try to make peace with the story because we want David to be that pristine hero. But I don't think we're supposed to make peace with the story. I think we're supposed to be horrified by it. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think we, we do the Bible and the, the, the book itself a disservice when we, we pull back from it just because we're uncomfortable. I, I mean, the Bible could have easily been left, I mean, sorry, this story could have easily been left out of the Bible. I, the writer of Chronicles does it. The writer of Chronicles says, nope, not going to include that. And he, he actually lifts the story, that beginning story of, of Joab at Rabbah and David's victory at Rabbah. And he lifts it from Samuel almost verbatim. And he, he skips over chapter 11 and he picks up the final few verses of chapter 12, again, verbatim. So he knows the story. Sure. And he he was so troubled by it, he couldn't even bring himself to include it as part of Israel's sacred history. And he also edits out all of the subsequent consequences of this act, because from here until David's final battle with the Philistines, the, the books, Second Samuel and First Chronicles, go two completely different directions. And they do the writer of Chronicles does not pick up anything out of Second Samuel until we get to First Samuel twenty or Second Samuel twenty four, hmm. and so you know that's a big stretch to just leave out. So we'll begin with verse one. It says, "In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab his servants with and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem." So this is the final verse that um, Samuel and and Chronicles shares. And the timing is significant. Uh, The spring of the year, or alternately the return of the year, it's Peshuva. Uh, We also see that word shuv, um, which is the center word shuv, as um, repent or return. So it's the Hebrew word for repentance. And Peshuv. Yeah. Yeah, Teshuvah can mean spring, but it, like I said, it can mean return. And so you've got that Hebrew playing with those double meanings of words again. So um, the return of the year when the, when the winter is over, the, the year anniversary after Joab's initial defeat of the Syrians, the Ammonites. And, and late spring was a traditional time of battle for uh, the ancient Near East. You know, the barley and wheat harvest are starting to ripen so the, the troops can eat as they pass on the fields. Um, the, the roads are drying out, and it makes sense for this to be a time of war. But it's funny to me that a lot of commentators really have a hard time understanding why David would wait a full year. But, you know, if you know anything about warfare and winter and fighting wars during winter, then you know that winter is not the ideal time. And Israel basically has two seasons. They have hot and dry, and they have cold and wet. Right. And so you don't have much in between. Yeah, and, that's, that sounds familiar. Hot and, of course, we're humid <laughs> more than dry, but hot and humid oh. and cold and wet. That's what we have here. <laughs> Precisely, yeah. Well, and, you know, when you think about it, during the winter, you don't have that readily available food, so now you've got to transport it, and this means wagons on muddy dirt uh, roads that are hard to to get down. Uh, that's if you have a road. There's a lack of shelter, so now you're looking at, at illness from exposure. Rusty weapons during a rainy season uh, season is a problem. Leaving a family at home during winter. Uh, keeping a fire going is a full-time job if you don't have readily available resources. So from a logistical point of view, it makes total sense that David would wait a year. And the, um, so the second wave comes in the winter, and a lot has been made of David sending Joab and while well, he stays at home. And rightly so, because 
the the warrior king is supposed to go out with his warriors. Uh, you know, he was chosen to be king because he led the armies out and he brought them in. Right. But for the last two chapters, David hasn't been going out. I mean, he's gone out that one time, and it sounds like he had to actually fight the battle, as opposed to Joab, where when Joab went out, everybody scattered. However, if we're just looking at this from a sheerly logistical viewpoint, David staying in Jerusalem kind of makes some sense because the city of Rabbah was taken through a siege, and a siege could last anywhere from a few weeks to a few months, depending on how much water and food the city had access to. Someone, right. need, someone needs to be in Jerusalem, and they need to be in charge of the country. And we know that Joab's perfectly capable of carrying out this act on his own without David holding his hand. The only real hint that we have that it might be a, pro a problem is this almost uh, editorial comment at the end of verse 1, but David remained in Jerusalem. So verse 2, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, and he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Now, the word for late one afternoon is, uh, it, it it originally had the connotation of sunset, uh, twilight, dusk. Uh, it's not just an afternoon nap that David is taking here. Uh, when he gets up from his couch or his bed, so he, he's, been, he's been asleep during the day. And this is a problem, Matt, a problem for uh, the rabbis because what's a king doing sleeping during the daytime? Especially whenever his main general is out actually fighting a war on his behalf. Mm-hmm. David has completely inverted the proper order of his life at this point in time. Instead of being in the trenches, you know, down, as far down as a man can go with his troops, he's on the rooftop. He's sleeping during the day. He's getting up at night. He, he's at home yeah. when he should be at war. So yeah, Everything's see, backwards. Everything. And, and that's... That's the point of this verse. You need to recognize David is, there's nothing about David's life how it should be. So he sees a woman bathing. Now, David is on his roof and looking down. And what I find to be interesting, we often assume that she is on her rooftop bathing. The scripture never says she's on her rooftop. That's an assumption we make about the story based on what we've been told. Right, and it seems kind of impractical given the time to bathe on the roof, because then you have to carry water upstairs and all your provisions and whatever else you got going on. Precisely, because we're in the spring. We, we are now moving out of the cold, wet winter. So she may have been on the roof. It was not uncommon for people to bathe on the roof. Uh, however, it was also not uncommon for people to bathe in courtyards or even in public spaces near wells. So, or, you know, whatever the city water source might be. We forget that a private bathroom is a luxury of our modern era. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Fleming. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I'm a fan. It's, it's a totally new concept. Um, there's nothing in, to, in the text to suggest that she's on the roof trying to get David's attention. So, and we also need to remember, David's house is taller, or probably would have been taller than everybody else's house. Just because he's the king, it's the most prestigious building. And he could have looked down and seen anything at this point in time, not just her on the roof. Uh, he would have seen the whole city before him, the dogs in the street, the kids playing. Um, the the idea that she is like the only thing that he could possibly see is ridiculous. And David chose hmm. to focus on her. Now, if you know your Torah, the word order here is, it should be starting to raise some alarms with you. Because David sees that she's beautiful, Tove. And we know, based on former passages, that this means the next step is to take. I mean, we have the same word order in Genesis 3. Eve saw the fruit was tove, it was good, it was beautiful, and she took. Genesis 6, 
the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were good, beautiful, and they took Genesis 12. The Egyptians saw uh, Sarah was beautiful or good, and that he t Pharaoh takes be the same theme again in Genesis 19, 27, 34, and 39. Right. So we we know what's going to happen, and the pattern is set within scripture so many times within Genesis that we understand seeing that something that is good or beautiful isn't, or that we perceive as good and beautiful, that taking is not always the right thing. Now, what I think is interesting is Bathsheba is described as Tov. She's the writers or the translators often use this to, uh, as the basis for translating it beautiful. Why did they choose the word beautiful rather than good? Both are, are legitimate translations. Right. And, and we have it in Genesis 3 that the fruit is good for eating. It's delightful for the eye. So why do we, we make a, an aesthetic judgment instead of a qualitative judgment about this woman? And could it be just because she is a woman? Just, just a thought. So, um, you know, when Brueggemann says that this fall rivals Genesis 3, he, he's not exaggerating. You can see that this is definitively a, an act patterned on Genesis 3, and it becomes, you know, just this giant flashing neon light of connectedness when you realize, too, that ultimately both stories are about one thing, and that's sacred space. You know, David wanting to build the temple, Adam losing the first temple in the form of the garden. And this, this is why this, um, this story is far more tragic than just David's violence against Bathsheba. That is it's, interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't considered the, the temple connection there. When God sets a leader in place, their actions impact everyone that is, they're responsible for. This is why we have to have yep. such high standards for pastors, for leaders of ministry, and why, if you want to go into ministry, you really need to stop and think, are you willing to give up the things in your life that might endanger the people that are under your care? And the other thing that's really interesting is when you look at the stories in context, God makes the covenant with David back in chapter 7 before the events with Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. God makes the covenant with Adam after. So, or th th there's a, a reversal there. So all is not lost. This is our one little bit of hope that we get to hold on to. So verse three, David sent and inquired about the woman and said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? So she's known that she has a name. She has a father. She has a husband. So when you look at who she, you know, who her father is, I mean, Eliam, he's uh, one of the 30 who fought with Ab uh, uh, sorry, Asahel, Joab's brother. This is the brother that Abner killed. And that was back in chapter two. He was one of David's mighty men. And Uriah the Hittite is also among that same group of men that fought with Asahel with Eliam. So both of her, her father and her husband are David's most trusted and fierce warriors. Hmm. Yeah, so this gets really interesting because it plays into some of the psychology, and I don't want to get too far into the psychology, but some unavoidable psychology within the text. Verse 4, And David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from uncleanliness. And the, the ESV includes that in a parenthetical, that last line. So... Hmm. A lot of people do not realize why she was bathing. And, and this is important. We're, we're told specifically what's going on here. So um, let, let's kind of go through this in order because I can get, I, I, this story got me so fired up. I can get really jumbled with my thoughts. But so first of all, when we have men or sons of God taking women, and David is a son of God at this point. Remember back in seven, he was adopted by God. Okay, And so it usually, when we have somebody taking a woman, it usually 
denotes something being done against a woman's will. The problem, according to some commentators, is that she came to him. Now, critics are going to say this means that Bathsheba was a willing participant. But you have to remember the type of power the king of Israel held. I mean, Saul had tried to kill David. He killed the priest at Nob. And then David had killed every messenger who brought him bad news about Saul's family. Every nation around Israel is deferring to David. Who knows better what kind of man David is than the woman who was raised in the house of one of his gibberim and a woman who married one of the gibberim? I mean, her father had served David probably her entire life. Mm -hmm. She grew up knowing how he treated her, uh, treated David, and how he believed David was worthy of being followed. There's a really good chance that as one of the gibberim, he was one of those who was in the hill country running from Saul with David. Then she marries Uriah, the Hittite, who believes that David is worth leaving his own country behind to join up with and to serve loyally. What kind of woman stands up against a man like David? And she does what so many women in this situation do. She chooses to survive. And basically, right. when we... Yeah, when we say to women today who have been victims of rape, well, why didn't you fight back? I think most of us know that's a stupid question to ask. That's a compassionless question to ask. And it, it really shows a lack of understanding on the, side, on the part of the person asking the question. This, Bathsheba's in the same situation. For her to refuse was basically looking at a death sentence. She did not have any choice in this situation. The king of Israel does not get sold no by anyone. Because if he does, he's already demonstrated he's going to kill him. Sure. So, so to think that a woman in this society would stand up against that is beyond ridiculous. And, mm. Uh, you know, she she did the smart thing. And now a, a quick note for anybody who um, who has been in the situation, because whenever we address topics like rape, we want to recognize there are people listening to this who've experienced that. If you do what you've got to do to stay alive in that moment. And we aren't saying that you need to fight back. And if anybody's ever told this story and and told it in such a way that has implied that somehow you failed by not fighting back whenever you were in that situation, uh, they're wrong, okay? They're, they're just wrong. You, you did what you needed to do to, to live. And that, when you get down to the bare bones, when you look at this in the context of Torah, the Torah is about preserving life. Mm -hmm. And so you were not in the wrong for preserving your life. And now, just within the text itself, we're never told how Bathsheba feels. She never speaks until much later. During this encounter with David, she does not talk. Right. Now, and, um, I, I want to jump in here because you mentioned something about her purifying herself. Um, and you said you were going to talk about that. Are we still getting mm -hmm. to that? Yeah, well, we, okay. we are. Because, okay, so I want to um, make sure because you said sometimes your thoughts get jumbled. I want to make sure we <laughs> miss it. Uh, yeah. Because there is an important point to be made here. So go ahead. Exactly. Okay. So the verse goes on and says, he lay with her. Now, that is important because David is the active person in the sentence. It's not her. It, and when we go back and we read like a uh, lot with his daughters, both times it, it talks about what his daughter's raping him, that she lay with him. They're yep. the active people, and we have absolutely no problem blaming Lot's daughters for being wrong, but we, we start to try to wiggle out of it whenever the exact same words are used of David. And so when we get to this final part, and I think it's really weird that the, that the uh, ESV puts it off as a parenthetical, almost like it doesn't matter, because it's very important. It's important for two reasons. Number one, we know that the child who dies is not Uriah's. This cleansing herself from un uncleanliness or impurity is she had just gotten through with her period. Yeah. And so she was not pregnant. Yeah. And well, in the ESV 
clearly states that it doesn't mm-hmm. euf- like not the ESV. The JPS states clearly what was going on where you mm-hmm. have a euphemism in the ESV because you can't talk about that stuff in church, right? Right. Even though it's mentioned so many times in the Bible. But the other reason why it's important, she's an observant, obedient Jewish woman. We're, we're told that her father was one of David's mighty men. He's identified as being part of the Jewish community. She is a woman who is obeying God. If she was a Hittite like her husband, she wouldn't have to follow the rules of the Torah versus being about being clean or unclean. She's a Jewish woman. And I, I'm saying this like a million times because there is this idea that if you are a good girl, if you follow the rules and you do all the right things, then you are never going to be the victim of sexual assault or sexual violence. Bathsheba was literally in the midst of fulfilling the obligation that was placed on her as a woman by the Torah. She was being obedient to God actively. And while she's doing this, this is when David sends for her. So there is this other lie that comes along that so often heard the church where, oh, how was she dressing? What was she doing? Where was she at? This is what caused her to be the victim of a rape. Well, the Bible presents us the story of Bathsheba that clearly shows us it doesn't matter. Rapes happen right. because there's rapist. And so I, I want to point that out. And I, I want to harp on it because too many women who are good Christian women who were doing the right thing, who were raped, um, they carry a lot, around, a, a lot of false guilt around and a lot of shame that is not theirs to carry. Because they think they did ask for it in some form or fashion. You, it doesn't matter. If, if somebody violated your no, they violated your no, and that's on them. The other thing is that, like I said, there's so many people who want to blame the victim and say, well, she must have been doing something wrong. Well, God's given you a story to show you clearly that's not how it works. And so I I want to make sure that we see that within the text, that Bathsheba was minding her own business, doing the right thing. She was in the right place. She was in her home. She was obeying God. It it doesn't get much purer on her part and and her deeds and actions. And yet David still chose to do this thing to her, this horrible thing to her. Mm-hmm. and. We have this tendency to want to validate it or contextualize it away and and make it somehow okay because it's David. Just because a leader is great or famous or prestigious in some way, they don't get to have some kind of free pass to behave this way. And we need to stop trying to defend this behavior. We need to be okay with saying, David did the wrong thing here. David was the one who sinned. The Bible never once places the blame on Bathsheba. He is the right. active person. He is the one who, who, who made the decision. And why? Because his life was completely upside down from where it should have been. And the seeds for that started way back in the past. We saw it with Hanun when David was extending compassion to the wrong person. And now he commits an act of violence against the wrong person. So we need to be careful with how we demonstrate our um, our love and commitment to God and, and trying to, to um, extend that loving kindness. Are we doing it for the right reasons to the right people? And are we trying to say in some areas of our life that because we are these you know great christian people that somehow it's okay for us to do things that are clearly wrong because i have known christians like that and when you when you violate god's law you're wrong <laughs> yeah well and and something else I, and i want to point this out uh I, you were talking about you know she was doing what she was instructed to do um mm-hmm. in the torah and one of the things that right now there's a really pop there's I, I say really popular i've seen it in a few different places this meme going around that lists a bunch of bible verses and talks about all the things that the old testament says are sins 
and they list menstruation on there. And it's like, that's not the no. point of that mm-hmm. verse because we're not talking about sin. And that's, right. it, it's very frustrating to me that we have, one, we're, we're, we're so badly studied in the Old Testament that we don't understand the difference between ceremonial, ritual purity, and mm-hmm. sin, that they're, they're two different things. Right. You know, God's not saying that a biological function uh, that you can't, that you have no control over is sinful. And that's, right. it, it's very, very frustrating to me that that's where, you know, we're so far removed and to the point where I had never, you know, put a lot of the stuff, I mean, I knew obviously, like I had this inclination that that there that that wasn't sinful, but you know, <laughs> just a couple of years ago, listening to uh, Doctor Heiser go through Leviticus, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that was eye opening. Talking about all the different things that you know, there is there's these things. There's the ceremonial laws. There's laws for ritual purity. None of those have anything to do really with um, with, with whether or not you're being sinful. Right. Um, it, it's about being able to enter the sacred space. And there's a time when you should and when you shouldn't. And so I just wanted to throw that out there too, because that taking that verse and saying that it, that menstruation is sinful. I mean, that's just, right. that's just another way to, to belittle women for being women. Mm-hmm. And I really don't see anywhere in the Bible that we're supposed to belittle people just for who they are. Right. Well, you know, in this story in particular, there's so many assumptions made out of it because we do have it, it is taught on so much that we have movies about it. And, you know, even right down to that little detail of thinking she's on her. Why do we think that it's not in scripture? It, it, it's something that is cultural. It's something that we have just picked up from tradition. And so this is another example of why we need to read what the Bible actually says and not mm-hmm. impose what we've been taught on the scripture as being right. The Bible as it's written, always trumps what you may have heard from a preacher or teacher or tradition somewhere. And so... Or a podcast, or a, even. Uh, <laughs> or a podcast. So that's, that's the big thing I wanted to lay out from the very beginning, is we have no indication that Bathsheba did anything wrong. In fact, it's, it, the Bible presents a completely opposite view. It, it's very clear. And the only way we can vindicate David is if we deny what's on the page. So it, we're going to talk so, next episode about actually how the Jewish way of attempting to get David out of this uh, situation uh, demonstrates their cultural bias. And so it's a great contrast in how we as Christians blame women and the uh, Jewish writers or the sages blame the goyim so, or the Gentile. Okay. Well, that sounds like a good place to break, and we will uh, <laughs> we'll be back next week with the the <laughs> continuation of this story and the crazy aftermath of 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 what happens when David rapes a woman. I mean, I don't know if yeah. <laughs> not trying to be flip about it, but you know, that's just kind of where we are in the story, and it's yeah. Kind of, kind of, it's kind of an awkward place to pause, but I think there's so much into the next bit. Of course, we're already at time <laughs> uh, for this week, but let's uh, let's uh, hit pause there, and I'll, I'll be interested to see kind of where things go from here, and and hopefully learn something. So, everyone out there, if you want to be part of the conversation, hit us up on RavenCreeksc.com. That's our website where you can find this show, show notes, other shows that we host. Um, and hit us up on social media, Raven Creek SC, and be part of the conversation if you have any questions or, you know, uh, suggestions or anything <laughs> of that nature. So until then, have fun. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.